So, thanks very much for the introduction and uh, not too many people here, but those who are here are probably interested. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, software provision. This is my very first time that I'm at the open source conference. So it's maybe a little bit strange. For me, it's new, interesting. And uh, the reason why I'm here is actually because of another talk, which I just had before, where I was introducing a very cool software for pattern analysis, which was published 2007, and it took us 15 years to make it open source. So now it's open source, but you probably ask yourself, why can it take 15 years until things become open source? Which is the reason why I thought, okay, I would like to express this uh, thoughts on that. So this is uh, from me, from the European Commission, but also from Pierre Rambo, who's at, working at the FAO, and uh, we want to talk about this. So this is a little bit of a philosophical take of things, so it's not uh, about science or so, but more some reflections about the provision of software. Software is used everywhere, and I think the common perception that most people have, maybe not necessarily Phosphor-G, which is a bit special, but in general, let's say, is that people think there are some people who develop software, who set up software, let's say. These are the developers or designers or software architects or programmers, and in general, they are perceived as nerds. You know, nerds who talk in very strange language, which no one understands. They talk about PEPCAC, for example, or RTF, or even WTF. Yeah? Then there are people who use software, the software users. So it's really a bipolar view of things. Software developers versus software users. Yeah, of course, there are the IT programmers themselves who use the software, but then everyone uses software. Kids, students, politicians, Industry, science, economy, military, whoever you want, there everyone uses software-driven applications. As a little image, you can see these uh, girls on their phone, of course, one of the key appliances nowadays. So our daily life is more dominated by software than we actually think. So this is a little bit of a reflection on that. So uh, some years ago, in 2019, I wrote a paper on software patterns in software design, which you can see at the bottom left, where I made, had some uh, thoughts about that all software projects themselves uh, have certain patterns, how they are developed and how they are structured. So based on that, I made some more thoughts now about this, that uh, software design or the source code, let's say, the software is just one part and then the users are the other part. But in fact, there are many, many aspects in between the provision of the software from the developer to the end users. So I tried to set this up as a kind of a small chart, as you can see here. So we start at the bottom left from the source code, where are the people who write the code. Then comes the topic of packaging the code. How do you disseminate your software? For which target platform do you do that? Then comes the topic of licensing, which obviously here at Open Source is uh, an interesting topic. But besides of that, there's also the documentation of your code. And then, which I think is the most critical part, is the feedback from the end user community to the developer, which is really, really critical. And I have the feeling, I'm not sure if I'm right, but I have the feeling that many people are not aware of the importance and the difficulties which you encounter when you do the software provision, which is the reason for this talk. So addressing each point here, the open source code is obviously critical for code maintenance, review, debugging, testing, the code improvement, adding new features and so on. But it's also critical for education, outreach and building trust and many more things. I don't need to go into detail because I'm really talking to the choir here. So for, for G community is well aware of the motivations for source code. However, I think that most end users actually cannot make use of the source code, either because their primary focus is not on the source code, but simply on using the software package that you provide, or because they do not have the technical expertise or the coding language skills to deal with the source code. Most people don't care about source code. I know this is a affront to say this here, but I'm pretty sure this is the case. So then comes the packaging. Once as you as a developer have done your source code, you need to provide it to the people. Obviously, there's a question for which operating system is it developed. You cannot just distribute it for each operating system because they have different requirements. Uh, of course, we have Windows, we have Linux, but even in Linux, you have many very uh, different packaging formats. Or do you want to make it in a setup in Docker? Do you want to make it for smart applications? 
or for Mac. Each of them have different ways of distributing the software, which is assigns on its own the distribution of the software. Yeah? So the application should function properly. So do we use dynamic or static libraries? What are the pros and cons of this? Of course, do we use a pre-compiled uh, application or does it need to be compiled from source? Which is nice, but it's also a limitation because people need to have compiler chain installed on the system, which is not necessarily the case. Obviously, there are also other generic formats such as Snap, Flatpak, Docker, VMware or whatever. The installation is not only simply the dissemination of the software for the system, but it should be accompanied by a proper installer system, which allows to uninstall. The question of administrator rights for installation is very important, because if you want your software to be used in, for example, government agencies, you cannot require your software to be used with admin administrator rights, because the people there will say, no, no, this is a no-go. So it should be installed in another way. Then the operating system menu integration, if you have a GUI or something like this, is also of important. Uh, with Linux, a specific difficulty is there are more than 1,000 Linux distributions. Basically, it's impossible to make one installer that fits all, which is actually a big disadvantage, where Windows and Mac is actually even easier for the distribution in this respect, although I'm definitely not a fan of these ones. But then there's also Android, iOS, do you want to have it as a standalone app or as a plugin for an existing application and uh, or even as a dedicated website to be independent of all these? So these are all questions that should be evaluated. The target platform, as I said, the different operating systems, target platforms or mobile devices. Ideally, you would want your application to work everywhere, which is obviously ideal. From this graph there, for example, it shows over the years the use of desktop versus mobile applications, where we can see that uh, mobile applications have actually surpassed desktop applications, which may also be of interest for future developments. Then the licensing. This is quite a nightmare, in my own opinion, because the license is a legally binding agreement. Don't forget about this. Yeah? So closed source license and open source license. Closed source license is actually quite nice if you want to have an easy life because you publish and that's it. Yeah? You get a black box to the user and that's it. Yeah? If you do open source, you should respect the four freedoms, inspect, use, modify, redistribute. There's the uh, open source initiative website where you can find 100 open, more than 100 open source licenses, terms like copyleft, copyright. Then the commission, for example, has set up an OSS review toolkit. If you have a project where there's not only one source code, but several source codes which come together with different licenses, you need to figure out which license is appropriate for your project, which is really a nightmare. I mean, they are really, I don't believe anyone understands the text that is written there. So since this is a legally binding agreement, it is actually important to understand what is written there. Yeah. So then there's the OSO, which was also mentioned this morning, which provides some guidance, like with a graphical interface, which license is most appropriate for your project. And it's important that all legal aspects are properly addressed. So basically, you need a lawyer to find out what is the right license, which is not easy. Anyway, then documentation is another important point, which is crucial for the software promotion, outreach, and adoption. Good documentation is important. There's a lot of work. Most people don't read it. Be prepared for that, that people don't read the manual, but the manual is there to explain what is going on. Besides the manual, you can make product sheets, flyers, or you can conduct workshops in order to disseminate the information about your software, or of course, do social media. Then I believe that one can say that a graphical user interface is one form of a documentation also, because it facilitates the use of the software and to uh, find appropriate sections in the software for specific tasks. Yeah? For example, su applications such as QGIS, ArcGIS, Grass, R Studio, Jupyter Lab, or whatever else, are nothing else as GUIs to underlaying software to make them easier to use. So is the operating system interface, such in, as in Linux, uh, KDE, GNOME, XFCE, or Android. These are all GUI interfaces to the underlying software itself. They are in themselves also software. And think of it as the mouse-driven GUI, which was published for macOS in 1984, which was the reason for success of Mac with this GUI interface, because people were not really willing to use command line only. Yeah? Then feedback, which in my view is the most fundamental aspect in software provision. 
as it is an indicator for all other provision aspects, serves as a quality control and as a bridge between the developers and the end user community because they can provide suggestions for improvement or bugs or whatever else. So the feedback is really, really important. Think of it that closed source projects, big uh, software projects, they have a dedicated marketing department only for that. Yeah? So that explains why it is so important. Yeah? It also helps to trigger creativity or attract new users. A very fine example is the GDAL project, which has very many forms of feedback, such as a mailing list, uh, GitHub chat, social media, or conferences also where things are uh, illustrated, how they work. Okay, then to give an example, I want to speak about GWB, which is actually an acronym for Guido's Toolbox Workbench, which is a software project which uh, I deal with for many years. It's not so important what it does here because I'm talking about the provision aspect of the software. So it's a generic image analysis modules for the Linux command line. Yeah? Let's leave it for this. Then in terms of source code, we have put everything on GitHub. The source code itself is in bash, C code, and IDL plain text. For those of you who don't know IDL, IDL is a proprietary software, but it's an interpreter language, and everything comes in plain text, which is interpreted line by line. I use it because I'm kind of old now, right? So I have used IDL all my life, and I'm not willing to start learning a new programming language five years before retirement. So I just do it because I know how my way around. And since it's all plain text, everyone can read through it. So another thing which we have added is an automatic version checker, which allows an auto update function. For the packaging, the thing since it's uh, for Linux, we use uh, either RPM or Debian packages. So they have to be compiled for this form, or since not every RPM package works on every RPM distribution, the same for Debian packages. One other step is MakeSelf, as you can see there, which is a really nice tool with which you can package your application into simply a tarball, which can run anywhere. And this is what we call the standalone installer, which has the additional benefit that any user can run this installer. So you do not need administrator rights, which is very important because many agencies do not allow you to install any kind of stuff into their system, which is pretty much locked down for security reasons. So you have, if you have an installer which allows you to do that in your own dedicated space, like in your home directory, then that's a cool thing. So we use that one. Then target platform, as I mentioned, it's designed to be used on Linux, either on desktop stations or on a web server. And in fact, it's a subset of the interactive GUI application, which is called Guido's Toolbox. So we have an image there, which is the pattern analysis software suit, let's say. Licensing was a big deal. In fact, I have to tell you, it took us 15 years to get this published as open source. 15 years. Yeah. Why? Because it's all, it was all about the licensing stuff. So we had to do license compatibility check because there are different models in there with different software licenses. At the end, we found a nice trick, which is the GNU Scientific Library, because that is included as one of the parts. And the GNU Scientific Library uses GPL version 3, which has a nice effect that it's very strong copy left license, which means you can have free use, modified, distribute, but you're always used, you're always forced to use the same GPL version 3 conditions, which means everything that you put in there will be GPL version 3. In this sense, GPL version 3 is, is nice because you have, you do not have to deal with anything, with any other compatibility because it all falls under GPL version 3, which again for us was a bit difficult because at the commission, they try to enforce us to use their own license. Why they have their own license is yet another story. So documentation, we have a web-based cloud computing on the JSC BDAP, which is a big data analysis platform, so it's cloud computing, and on FAO CEPAL, which is also a cloud computing platform, free cloud computing platform. Then Pierrick has uh, developed a Jupyter and Voila ba based dashboard to facilitate the user interaction with the various models, as you can see there on the right. And this is accompanied by sample processing descriptions for the command line as well as the GUI interface on CEPAL. Feedback. 
the Guido's Toolbox Workbench, this program there itself is a very nice example for feedback because it came into life after people used the desktop application, which is GUI driven, and said it would be nice to have the modules outsourced into a separate application, which you can run on web servers, which can then serve as a GIS backbone, for example, that you do not have to interact as well, but you can add it into, uh, into your scripts. Yeah. Uh, there's two versions of it. The same program can be used uh, either as a Debian package, where of course you need the app administrator rights to install them, but also the standalone mode. Everything is documented and full open source on GitHub and the version update checker makes it easy to check for new versions. So as conclusions, software provision, in my view, see this is my personal view, but I think it's a very critical component in the whole life cycle of software designed to promote outreach and accept the software. So I think if you put some uh, closer look into each of these aspects, it may actually help you to get a bigger impact of your software. Of course, it enhances understanding compared to learning dissemination of other softwares also. Uh, for the communication between the end users and the developers is really critical. And obviously what I showed there in this graph is just an example, so depending on your project, that you have. You may have other aspects or, uh, that are not covered here, but in principle, that's about it. And I think that the FOS4G conference itself is one form of software provision. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>